Good afternoon, this is Chris Dawson from Tame Bay and for this webinar we're once again joined by Craig from World First. In our first webinar we looked at how to recognize the trigger to recognize that your business has grown to a sufficient size and scale to capitalize on international trade and today we're going to take a deeper dive into looking at the the best countries and territories to start uh, um, launching your international sales so without further ado I'd like to hand you over to Craig welcome Craig thank you very much Chris hello everyone and thank you for joining us uh, today I am very excited to start the second webinar of our series as Chris said so yes where should you sell now we'll be looking at countries and territories we will be thinking about which uh, products sell uh, where the opportunity is what the particular consumer preferences are in certain markets unfortunately we won't be going through every single country out there um, or perhaps fortunately um, but we will be looking at a selection of them um, and seeing exactly what is involved in getting set up and ready to go um, as you can see on the uh, on the slide at the moment um, the next webinars in three weeks time it is how to use marketplaces to best effect in those countries so we'll be drilling down even further and thinking about which marketplaces are great for certain products or, or, and certain features and um, hopefully giving you some nice practical tips to, to move away with um, so in the meantime we will continue research and uh, considering where to trade abroad um, please do head along to Tame Bay's website to download the white paper um, it is a great read it's all about how to master international success exactly the same theme as the webinar series but there's some really good case studies in there some great tips from sellers that are doing it successfully um, and and to scale um, so it's definitely a great place to start and even if you have already started it's also great to pick up some uh, some pointers or even uh, vindicating uh, perhaps some of the decisions you've already made so please do download that right so today we'll be looking at the hottest international market so looking at the the past and present seeing which are the opportunities um, and where should you look to for your next customer um, secondly we'll be looking at the product trends and shopping preferences as I said so payment methods delivery obstacles um, what what you know particular products sell well in certain countries and then finally we'll be looking at um, some specific uh, hurdles to um, uh, navigate when you are trading abroad in those spe uh, specific countries so first of all um, the survey from the uh, white paper uh, that uh, Tame Bay um, have put out, um, where, where is the right place to sell? So um, a whopping 50% of respondents said they ship globally anyway. So the reality is you probably are servicing those, those customers in other countries. You might not be listing into that particular country. You might have no real intention to sell into that uh, country. It might just be the passive demand at the moment that you're you're getting through them buying off your .com site or buying from another country's marketplace. Um, then the second uh, biggest factor in choosing the right place to sell was um, where uh, are marketplace available? Um, so what sort of marketplaces um, are there in each country? Um, what does the infrastructure look like? That's, that's a, big, uh, a, a big factor in uh, everybody's um, uh, choice uh, on where to sell next as well, apparently. Um, obviously, the US is a huge opportunity. We won't be going into it in great detail today because, to be honest, uh, we barely scratch the surface. Um, I, I think that it is quite well documented elsewhere. There's a, there's a nice piece about it in the uh, white paper. Uh, around selling into the US um, but it, it certainly is a great opportunity not just because of uh, you know having having the English language in, co in common but also you know a lot of the preferences are quite similar um, and the market is that much more vast than the UK and European markets um, and then the uh, a close um, 
uh, closely following, we have uh, choosing countries based on popularity of their products there. It might sound obvious, but it is quite a difficult one to gauge sometimes, especially if you're selling branded products or a specific um, type of product that, that might not actually be available in a certain country. Um, it is important to do the research and find out, you know, what, what uh, sort of upside can you expect from sales into that country. Um, and then finally, um, choosing countries uh, that uh, they are familiar with, um, online sellers said. So yeah, it's actually quite uh, low down uh, down there. Um, and it might just be because, uh, you know, perhaps um, it's, you know, there are a, a small pool of uh, countries that the online sellers are intimately familiar with to start with. The key bit to take away from this is that, you know, if you do your research, you should actually be quite familiar with the country before you actually start to sell there. So hopefully this will form some of that research. So where were the hottest international markets in 2015 and to what sort of scale? So uh, this is the past of the piece that I was um, that I'd given you uh, a bit of an intro to. Um, you can see by country mile, um, China and the US and even Japan to some extent um, are the biggest markets in terms of B2C um, retailing um, in those markets. Those um, are some very key ones. Um, we're actually, um, you know, when we look at the 2017 stats, um, you can see that, you know, in terms of China, the, the potential there has only increased. Um, similarly for the US, a nice jump there, but you'll see some other countries, perhaps some, some unexpected ones there that are actually, um, you know, a decent size opportunity for uh, sellers that, um, you know, either aren't selling internationally at all or, or already selling perhaps in, in Europe and in the US. Um, we'll be diving into uh, China in a bit more detail um, in a moment. Um, but before we do, let's exclude China and the US and the UK from that list. And you can see that the, the opportunities there are really centered around, you know, you've got Germany there, um, might seem like an obvious market with it almost being on our doorstep, but um, a crucial one and one that, you know, there are some, some nuances in, in the consumer behavior in that market. Um, also, Japan's uh, a big one, so we'll, we'll be looking at that. Um, India is actually a very difficult one to, to sort of penetrate at the moment. And the reason behind that being, you know, lots of uh, bureaucratic or, or sort of uh, legal hurdles, I guess, into in actually getting set up to sell into that country. But um, it's one that we'll consider and, and one that we'll um, we'll talk about later. And, and the Latin American countries, you know, particularly Brazil and Mexico, um, are on there. They're they're registering pretty well as well in terms of sales. So so we'll be looking at a few of them. There'll be some notable ones that we won't go into in this session, uh, but we will definitely be mentioning uh, next week in terms of marketplaces. That those being, uh, you know, South Korea, obviously, um, Russia and, and Saudi Arabia. So uh, let's dive into China. Um, I think that everybody recognizes it's an opportunity. I don't think everybody recognizes the best way to capitalize on it. So um, in terms of the categories that sell well, um, you might not be surprised to see cosmetics and fashion and so on and shoes and accessories um, leading the charts in terms of consumers that have bought those products online. Um, a bit further down, we've got uh, kids wear and baby products. They're still very uh, popular compared to other countries, um, purely because of uh, the concern around the provenance of a lot of those products in China. So they'll quite often buy Western brands when it comes to um, kids' products uh, or baby, um, you know, for example, infant formula and so on, which I'm sure lots of you listening are already aware of um, and then you know obviously conspicuous consumption I guess we call it in a way uh, you know luxury brands things like that they do very well in China um, as you might expect um, but curiously you know it is very much sort of via grey channels and, and so on that uh, those products are largely being sold so if you do have your own brand um, it's an opportunity to take control of it um, by, by looking at China and selling directly into China. Um, in terms of the key dates, um, I've listed off a few there. Uh, we've got Chinese New Year's, um, you know, a big one. Um, and we've got uh, Wawaini and Double Seventh on the 20th of May and 
and the 7th of August there. Um, and of course, the, um, the, the notorious uh, Singles Day, Double Eleven as it's known, on the 11th of November each year, um, pioneered by Alibaba. It's really an opportunity. Um, I, I guess it's the equivalent really of, of Black Friday, Cyber Monday and the Christmas period all rolled into one date for uh, Chinese consumers. Uh, a lot of consumption gets put off until that date purely because they're waiting for the, the big discounts, the big deals. Um, and as we've seen recently, Alibaba's most recent Singles Day broke all records by a country mile and um, ultimately uh, probably will get uh, even bigger next year. We, I think it was around $30 billion um, in terms of sales this year, which, you know, when you compare that to Amazon's projected Prime Day sales, uh, you know, of a few billion, um, you know, it's very uh, impressive indeed, um, but also slightly daunting. So how do you actually capitalize upon this? How do you appeal to the Chinese consumer potentially? Well, you might not be surprised, it's all about mobile. So um, if you are not mobile ready uh, in terms of your sales strategy into China, I mean, it, it probably won't just be enough to list on marketplaces. You will need some sort of uh, social media presence across um, across WeChat, across uh, uh, Weibo, uh, they are the key channels. And to uh, content and discovery, um, they are crucial for virtually all e-commerce brands. So um, if you're selling into China, it's important to think about how you're going to engage with consumers. And we don't just mean sort of on a customer service level, we mean in terms of creating buzz, creating um, you know, a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a, a luster or, or um, premium around your brand. Um, those, these are the, the best ways of doing it. Um, again, it needs to be heavily localized. You can't just go out there with translated content. It's not going to work. Um, it is really a case of making sure that it's, um, it's adapted to each channel. So for WeChat, we'd be looking at mini programs. Uh, for Weibo, you'd be looking, uh, you know, it's a, it's a micro blogging site. So um, anything that you can do in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Twitter like uh, updates or statuses. Uh, Baidu's the uh, de facto search engine in China. So uh, they've got a, a forum, uh, the Tiebo, um, uh, part of their site where people would discuss brands and it's important to sort of be part of that discussion. On TikTok, it's like uh, Snapchat to an extent, um, but it's very sort of short video clips, uh, lots of viral um, dancing and singing and so on. Um, people love the videos. They, they want to share them with their friends. So if you can come up with some sort of um, ads that, that get served in between those videos that, that people are engaging with, you know, that, that's, that's a great way of boosting your brand in the market. Um, and uh, Yuku is quite similar in many ways to YouTube, although a bit less heavy on the user generated content, a bit more sort of traditional TV shows, movies and so on. But having said that, you know, you can can get on there and, and include, you know, um, similar sort of, I guess, longer form content than what you're doing on TikTok onto the Yoku platform as well. So um, those are the channels in terms of exploiting them. Um, uh, you know, unless you're you're fluent in uh, Mandarin, you're probably not going to get very far. I would suggest um, enlisting the help of a dedicated agency. There's one out there called Ping Pong Digital who are very uh, seasoned in that realm. They work with a lot of the bigger brands, but um, they they are certainly a, a route to um, you know creating some buzz in China. Because otherwise, without that, your marketplace sales, you know, it is going to be like um, uh, finding a needle in a haystack for those Chinese consumers to find your brand unless they already have some name recognition. Um, so moving on to Germany, um, again, I said it was a uh, obvious market, uh, perhaps not. You know, when you're looking at the um, uh, the distribution of the categories, um, you know, clothing and footwear tops the list probably uh, to be expected. Uh, books are very high up there though, but you know, obviously bear in mind, you know, German language um, books predominantly, although, um, you know, there's probably quite a, a large sort of market for the English language. Um, and then all the way down to, to uh, you know, CDs, films, DVDs, cosmetics, and finally homeware, home furnishing. Um, 
it's a it's a great market for um, you know in terms of the maturity of the market. There's it's still it's growing at the fastest rate of uh, the European uh, countries. Um, so you know there's lots of upside there, but um, you know it's already well established. Um, in terms of the key dates, um, you've you have here uh, Carnival and and uh, uh, Fashion. Fasnacht uh, in March uh, next year. Um, those are quite good for any costume sellers. Um, but also we've got Sommerschlussverkauf, which is uh, the um, typical sort of summer sales that occur uh, from the 27th of July to the 8th of August. Um, and then St. Nicholas's Day, which is actually really, you know, uh, the, the start of the Christmas shopping season, perhaps, um, in earnest in Germany. Um, and, you know, obviously coincides around at the time of Cyber Monday. So uh, just, you know, in terms of tying in promotions, those are, those are quite good dates to be mindful of um to to capitalize on that demand um so what is the german consumer you know looking for and what does what do they look like typically so very security conscious you know um it is really a case that you know they want to buy from you know companies and sites that they trust um and and quality and and knowing that they're getting a, a good product you know um and also familiarity as well is very important so having a localized website as well is really important um you need the impression on there on the on the site um it's a legal requirement um to to show who the site owner is but um you know it's having a .de domain is crucial to capturing uh, you know the direct to consumer sales if you're not selling by or if you're selling on there alongside marketplaces um in terms of returns uh consumers can return purchases within 14 days without any explanation whatsoever so that could be quite challenging um, if you don't have a robust uh, returns, logistics, refulfillment partner in place. So, um, you know, make sure that you have something to cope with that. Uh, you'll get a lot higher rate of returns um, in Germany, likely. And, you know, as it says, with no explanations provided. So do your best to understand the reason behind those returns, you know, whether that's a, a post sales questionnaire or, you know, something included within the returns uh, label or something like that, that, you know, requires no effort on the part of the consumer to explain to you why they're being returned, because otherwise uh, it may be like banging your head against a brick wall um, with, with those high return rates and the costs involved. Um, and when it comes to payments, um, there are, Online payment services in general, so sort of e-wallets or gyro pay, so forth, revising, they rival credit cards in popularity against, um, you know, uh, amongst the, the, the payment methods. So making sure that you support those uh, or, or one or all of them is, uh, is a good idea. Um, if you're using your own site, lots of marketplaces do by default. Um, and actually even purchasing on account or, or bank transfer are popular payment methods as well. So be mindful of that, you know, having a local bank account in Germany could be useful um, if you're selling you know, large ticket items or, or reasonably expensive um, items and, um, you know, uh, people want to pay via bank transfer, you know, that, that is an option. Um, but there are obviously also risks involved in that. Um, moving on to Japan, um, the, that's, uh, the percentages are actually, uh, in this instance, um, the proportion of sales uh, in each category of, of total online sales. Um, you'll notice that food, beverages and alcohol are right there up the top. Um, the reason for that is, like, well, I mean, it's mostly attributed to the rise of click and collect. Um, with convenience stores in Japan. So um, really, I mean, for the, the purposes of, of this uh, particular exercise, we can probably exclude them, but it is interesting to know um, how that's such a, a big um, a big element of e-commerce in Japan. Uh, aside from that, we've got books, CDs, DVDs, consumer electronics, and, and probably the usual suspects in various ways, shapes, and forms. Um, the interesting bit there being that clothing is quite a bit lower than uh, in lots of the other the market um, and that is really you know I guess a, a product of potentially the audience which will come on to um, but you know also you know the the choice that they have from from physical outlets and, and potentially you know what online shopping is typically used for in Japan um, in terms of the key dates uh, we've got National Foundation Day on the 11th of Feb, White Day on March the 14th think of it like the um, 
reverse of Valentine's Day where um, women are um, gifting products or, or gifts to men. Um, we've got Golden Week in May. Uh, seasonal bonus time happens around June, July and also in December, so twice a year. So having some nice promotions running along that period could be lucrative. And they're quite big on Halloween as well uh, in Japan. So um, having uh, any sort of costumes or or typical um, Halloween uh, sort of fair around that date um, could could be a good idea. So in terms of the uh, preferences for the Japanese consumer, we're talking um, quality above all else. I mean, Western products and brands are often seen as a, a symbol of status, um, and not so much in the ostentatious sense, you know, of I'm wearing a, you know, I look how um, sort of bling I look potentially, um, but more around, um, you know, uh, a sign of quality really, uh, more than any of that. Um, uh, ostentatious element um, but also uh, as a way to experience the lifestyle of that you know the country of origin so you know experiencing um, the the lifestyle of the, of the provenance um, of the products is is you know quite a big thing for for Japanese consumers so buying whiskey from Scotland or um, you know uh, Burberry handbags from the UK or you know something along those lines you know that that's a way for them to sort of vicariously experience um, that that lifestyle um, they're also very uh, big on convenience as well um, that's actually been a more recent trend that we've seen um, where more Japanese are actually spending more time at home. So, you know, it's really about online shopping as, you know, less uh, a necessity or an inconvenience, more about um, them actually using it as a form of entertainment almost. Um, and kind of following on from that, looking at the listings that you see on Japanese marketplaces and websites, I mean, the Japanese consumer expects to learn absolutely everything there is to know about products via their in-depth listings. So, you know, having um, details of how the products are constructed, what sort of material they're made of, the dimensions, um, what, you know, uh, potentially, you know, several videos or, or, you know, photos showing them in action. Um, you know, that is crucial for Japanese consumers. Um, and obviously that all needs to be localized. That all needs to be in Jap Japanese. Uh, you know, 99% of the Japanese population only speak Japanese. So, you know, it is crucial that it's all there uh, localized uh, for them to enjoy uh, and to ultimately buy from. And, and when we're looking at the ultimate demographics of the uh, of online shoppers, they're actually skewed older than, than in many countries. So uh, young people actually spend less than the middle aged. So, um, you know, that's, that's quite interesting. And, and, you know, in terms of the sorts of products you stick online, you know, chances are if they're targeted at a sort of middle age range, um, you might get a bit more traction. Loyalty points schemes are also incredibly popular. Uh, Rakuten Ichiban, uh, the Japanese marketplace, um, quite recently issued their, um, uh, I think it was something like a stock of one trillion yens worth of super points over the course of its history. So, you know, we're talking about $10 billion worth of um, super points, these loyalty points. And the difference in Japan is that those can be burned almost as easily as they can be earned. So there's, there's quite a lot of liquidity there. Um, and, and that actually gives... Japanese cons uh, consumers reason to come back to websites. So if you are running your own e-commerce site, think about launching your own loyalty scheme. And if you're on a marketplace, make sure that you're dialed into whatever points uh, are being issued um, and, and run promotions around that. So uh, moving uh, around the world uh, once more, looking at Latin America, specifically Brazil and Mexico, they're probably the most mature of the um, Latin American sort of countries um, e-commerce markets. Um, in terms of the types of products, uh, again, fashion and accessories features very uh, prominently, um, but also books and subscriptions and appliances as well in Brazil, you can see there in terms of top categories. Um, the lack of domestic availability for lots of products um, is a, a hindrance uh, for the consumer, but uh, an opportunity potentially for anybody selling into that country. Um, I mean, some of them are prohibitively expensive because of tariffs, et cetera, but some of them 
just have no availability because you know uh, they've been overlooked or they're only available in the grey market via resellers or whatever. So if you've got a brand and you know that you're selling something into Brazil or that Brazilian consumers or uh, Mexican consumers are getting their hands on your products, um, why not be the one to make the sale in the first place, I guess is, is the question there. Um, in terms of the consumer's delivery expectations, they take a long time to arrive. So if they're shipped from outside the region, um, then that is something that you know can lead to uh, delays um, and can also, um, you know, ultimately, you know, it's built into the expectations of that consumer as well. So uh, I guess you know, it's just to be aware of it. You know, it can take a while unless they're being fulfilled uh, from within the country, which I know, you know, uh, in terms of uh, Mexico FBA, that is possible now, but, you know, you'll need to make sure that you can get those products through, you know, custom, uh, either custom brokers or, or some sort of local fulfillment partner or um, or, or uh, shipping partner uh, to actually get those products to the FBA warehouses in the first place. Um, alternative payment methods are crucial in Latin America. Um, they're, they're supported by regional marketplaces. They'll be built in, so you, you won't need to worry necessarily too much about that. But if you're selling on your own website into Latin America, which, you know, potentially is, is very difficult, um, you know, you would need to think about which uh, gateways or payment service providers can support those local uh, payment methods. If we're looking at India, um, India's uh, very skewed at the moment towards, uh, you know, electronics and fashion. Um, with actually, fashion's due to overtake electronics in terms of products being searched for online very shortly. Uh, books and beauty and personal care are up there, and also like with China, you can see baby cares uh, featuring in that list as well of top categories. Um, in terms of the key dates, uh, they've they've got quite a lot. They've got religious holidays. Um, around sort of uh, Navarati, Jacera, and Durga Puja, and Diwali as well. Um, but uh, also, they do, uh, you know, in terms of uh, an economic holiday, Christmas is, um, you know, is also uh, quite popular there. Um, and then Independence Day, Valentine's Day, and Republic Day as well are also useful ones to, to sort of uh, plan um, promotions around potentially. Um, so the Indian consumer, what you know, what are the sort of trends that, that we see there, and, and what should you be mindful of? So um, they're very prudent uh, Indian consumers. They they do want quality, and they don't want necessarily to pay a huge amount for it. Um, I mean, even amongst the middle class, as I've said, there, you know, it's still much of that spending still spent on the base consumption so the discretionary spending um on luxuries on things they want not necessarily what they need um you know that that is expected to be met by very high product quality so if they're spending money on a low pro, a low quality product um, don't expect to gain much traction um and local co companies are actually quite already quite competitive in that respect because there isn't a huge amount of international uh, competition at the moment which is something I'll come on to next which is that there are a lot of restrictions around the Indian market so how can you sell on market I mean in terms of selling on marketplaces it's very difficult quite often you either need to uh, launch some sort of joint venture you need local operations potentially to um, uh, start a foreign owned entity you'll need at least one director resident in india based there for more than 182 days what i would suggest is um, speak to supply chain uh, consultants um, specialists in that market if they're if anybody's interested please do email me after the fact you know i'm happy to um, sort of link you up with a, a few people that uh, you know within within uh, our network in terms of you know uh, being able to help you into that market. Um, it, it will be quite expensive, but um, there's a huge opportunity there still. There's still you know over a billion people in India that are looking for um, you know products from the West, and at the moment they're they're probably having to go via you know, the grey market or via local distributors to do that. But that, I mean, that is also potentially a way that you could do it if you find a local distributor. Um, infrastructure challenges, so they'll often, uh, consumers will often pay cash on delivery, which is expensive and, and time consuming for merchants to process. So, um, you know, 
thinking about that, you know, building that into your margins is crucial and, and delivery to rural areas can be challenging. So all of that combined, you know, it sounds like that's only bad news, but actually, you know, it, it is one of the reasons that India is so exciting because it is a tough one to crack. Um, and I mean, if you have the resources or the uh, determination to crack it, then, um, you know, certainly an opportunity there. So finally, um, sort of wrapping up that whistle stop tour of various countries, you know, and various, you know, potential, you know, markets with lots of potential. Uh, it wasn't an exhaustive list, as I said, but, you know, the main takeaway, I think, um, and it will be no surprise to all of you if you're Tame Bay readers, is lev leverage the marketplaces, use their infrastructure. It's already tailored to local markets and the local consumer and their preferences. Um, and then, in you know use the data you're getting out the back of that so learn from that sales data and, and understanding what products are going to sell what's not you know what's not viable really um and what is viable because you you will be surprised there there will be products that sell that you think actually that's I've, i had no idea that there was any demand uh in that market and i mean that is the beauty really of cross-border commerce there are so many surprises um and finally also use local experts when entering a market so what's that mean so in China, don't sell into cross-border into China um, without that uh, onshore social media presence or strategy. Um, and if you're serious about building your brand, think about you know getting a, a, a local domain hosted inside the country so that consumers can get a, a uh, access to your your own sort of marketing piece without the latency involved in the you know going through the great firewall of china or, or trying to access servers offshore um you'll also need to make sure that your store um uh, in terms of um, repatriating cny there's lots of solutions out there uh world first actually do offer a solution for that as well but you know um if you are earning sales in cny uh, make sure that you're able to get it out of uh, the country as well. Um, and I mean, Alipay and so and JD.com and so on can actually do that, you know, convert it into dollars and send it to you. So, you know, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. And, you know, we can certainly help as well with helping to, re to receive those dollars and, and make the most of them. Um, and it's first to file in China when it comes to trademarks. So you won't necessarily be able to get uh, your product's names or your, co your company's name. Um, uh, without um, perhaps some local competition. Um, so think about um, localizing your brand perhaps for the, the market. Don't just go in there necessarily with, with a brand. I mean, as an example, World First um, is very difficult to pronounce um, by, by you know Chinese nationals. So uh, we've actually um, developed a local brand there that is uh, we, we've launched recently called Wan Li Wei, and uh, actually built you know a, a, a lot of um, collateral around that and a lot of capital in that um, to to sort of appeal to the local market a bit more. Um, Germany, so yeah, returns are crucial, refulfillment and support local payment preferences. Um, I think that's that's fairly straightforward. In Japan, make sure that you have in language support, that all of your listings are detailed and localized. You're supporting loyalty points of some sort. And uh, bear in mind, if you do want a local JPY bank account, it is gonna be virtually impossible to open thanks to lots of sort of anti-corruption, anti-crime and organized crime rules uh, over there in Japan. So use a specialist provider like World First. Again, we can offer you uh, JPY accounts in that market to, to help you um, collect your funds locally and, and do whatever you need to do with them, whether it's managing your FX risk or using those, those Japanese yen locally. Um, and in the US, um, although we didn't mention it in this uh, wider piece, but just make sure that you are, you know, speak to tax specialists and, and register and file in any states where you have nexus or you could end up with a, a rude awakening down the line once um, the other shoe falls with regards to this, this quite fluid situation at the moment, um, you know, following on from the, the Wayfair ruling where, um, you know, the tax authorities or the state tax authorities are a bit more emboldened now to, to start pursuing uh, e-commerce merchants. Um, and in Latin America, uh, use tracked and insured shipping methods. It, it'll get there quicker, potentially. Um, at least you'll also be able to see where any holes are in terms of, um, you know, the the delivery uh, sort of infrastructure you have in place. Um, if if it, the local methods are quite unreliable, um, partially tracked 
you know, services could could work. It could be more expensive, but ultimately, you know, results in the better consumer experience. Um, and managing cash flow as well. You know, we, we talked about various payment methods. Just make sure that, the, uh, you know, you have ways to, to bridge that. Um, you know, to cope with any delays to payments um, and then local language support as well. So particularly Spanish and Brazilian, uh, Portuguese, um, you know, in those two specific countries we talked about, you know, making sure that, that you get, uh, that the consumers there feel that they they have a, you know, a localized solution. Um, and finally, in India, um, you could register a local company or find a local distributor or, you know, like I said, a supply chain advisory company that could could help you with with setting up that supply chain solution. So not just getting the products in and getting them to consumers, but then actually getting INR out because obviously INR is a controlled currency. It's very difficult. So uh, Indian rupees, that is. Um, so repatriating those very difficult at the moment so just make sure you have something in place to, to get those out in a cost effective way before you actually commit to that market in any further depth so um wow we've been around the world uh several times back and forth uh back in time you know forward to the future um so what's in our immediate future uh following on from this so in three weeks time we have um, the how to use marketplaces to best effect webinar, the pièce de résistance of this series. Um, I'm very excited about it. I feel like it is really going to be a huge payoff from all of the research and thinking about, you know, um, introspectively whether your business is ready to trade in abroad and in which markets. We'll be looking at practical tips, which categories um, sell well in certain marketplaces, which are the hot marketplaces, where are the place, you know, the the, the right channels really to, to prioritize moving forward. Um, and again, if you haven't already, download this white paper. It's a rollicking good read. Um, I've, you know, very much enjoyed reading it over a, a cup of coffee. I hope you will too. Um, there's some there's some good bits in there um, and obviously it does help to inform uh, the wider picture outside of this um, and so with uh, without any further ado then Chris um, I'd like to throw it back to you I uh, hope everybody listening uh, enjoyed what I had to say but otherwise um, you know are there any questions you have from the, uh, the panel <clears throat> yes yes we've got questions coming in so first question for you is from Henrik which is based on your knowledge and expertise, what would you say are the biggest challenge for Western com companies entering Chinese e-commerce? Um, so and that's a great question, uh, Henrik. Thank you very much for it. So I, I, without a doubt, I think that it is, you know, how do you stand out in that market? You know, it, we looked at the scale of, you know, uh, revenue. And when you think, you know, that there's, you know, uh, be, you know, a billion or, or, you know, approaching, you know, uh, more than that, you know, in terms of the population, we we really need to think about, you know, how do we actually create buzz? How do we, and also, you know, how do we, you know, convey those, those Western brands or those Western product, you know, um, values or cachets over to China? So, you know, like I said, social media, is is crucial um and just making sure that it ties into your wider marketplace strategy marketplaces are king in china but having you know a local solution as well there's a there's a company out there called sudify who uh you know uh, like the um you know they're sort of geared up to be the, the chinese shopify if you like so you know onshore in china um you know that they, they they are able to build something that will actually allow your consumers to to consume um your marketing in a localized way so yeah just making sure that it's it's really you know you you're ticking off social you're ticking off marketplaces you're ticking off your your dot com in china and um that you're uh, you know, uh, that those are all aligned as well, that they don't, you know, contradict or conflict with each other, I think. And then um, Abhishek um, asks, um, could you share the percentage of cross-border commerce for international brands as a percentage of their overall um, sales for each of the target countries we've highlighted? So I, I guess they're asking, if I go into, say, Germany, what percentage of my overall sales could I expect to come from Germany or Latvia? Latin America or India, China, et cetera? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question, Abhishek. Um, in terms of the, the, you know, the hard data, we'll, we'll get into, um, you know, uh, 
a bit of a comparison um, next time around in three weeks in terms of you know what, what that really looks like. I mean, in terms of UK businesses, UK brands, um, I mean, you know, it, it, when you look at the markets that are most um, in tune with those those sort of those Western brands, um, I mean, you know, you've got uh, China, the UAE. And India as well, who are, you know, they're all in the in the high 60% when you they say that they you know they are actively looking for Western brands when they are shopping on on marketplaces. So you know that that is something that's you know an opportunity for um, you know UK based sellers or Western based sellers to to really you know satisfy that demand. But again, you know, in some of those markets, you do need to be very you still need to be price competitive. It's not as though they'll buy at any any cost really. And the next question, I think we're probably going to get into a little bit more in the next webinar, which is what are the entry barriers for international brands across categories in each country that's covered in the presentation? And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing part of that's going to be answered in the next webinar by um, how to use marketplaces as, uh, um, to, to start penetrating these countries. Well, absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. We will get into that. But, we, you know, also, um, it's there. There are very um, specific uh, country rules, around, you know, and laws, and you know, things like that. I mean, on a very sort of top high, you know, top level, you know, things. You know, if you're already selling across Amazon, you probably know a lot of this already. But you know, making sure that you do have, um, you know, you are an authorized, you know, reseller or have permission to to sell certain brands on certain marketplaces. You know that that is crucial. Um, ensuring that plug types are correct, and you know, and that um, they meet, you know, minimums or uh, safety requirements in those countries. I mean, the good thing about you know UK in general is that we do have pretty stringent um, requirements anyway. So the chances of you falling foul, you know, along safety, you know, the lines of safety are, are, are you know, relatively small. But again, even though you know they're they're not necessarily completely transferable into other markets so you know certainly in china they're very you know sensitive about um you know like i said uh, infant milk formula and things like that the, you know it needs to it needs to go through various um channels um and, and really you know i guess covering off all that legal piece you know i i'm not the right person necessarily to to give you that advice but it would my only advice is to speak to somebody who is well versed in in those sort of international legal matters um and and just make sure that you know of the marketplace channels that you're selling on that you know do read all the fine print do go into all of the minutiae of each category and we will cover it in some detail um you know next time around as well and a uh, final question from Ricardo um, is how would you tackle European VAT registration with Amazon being a UK seller? And I guess regardless of what happens with Brexit, this is going to be a, a very valid question. As soon as you start selling on multiple Amazon sites and put your products into FBA, Amazon could be storing them in not just the UK, France, Germany, Italy and Spain countries where they've got marketplaces, but also in places like the, the, the Czech Republic, for example. Um, so ha, ha, do, you, do you have any advice on the tackling the, the, the VAT registration and perhaps then how submitting VAT returns on, go, ongoing? Yeah, so I, I mean, VAT is, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. So, um, you know, when we're talking about the, um, uh, you know, the, first of all, do you need to pay it, you know, in certain countries? Well, invariably, yes, now, you know, regardless of, you know, where you're selling from, where you're selling to, you know, even with distant selling thresholds, you know, especially if you're using FBA or, you know, attempting to fulfill from within market or from within any of those countries that you said there, Chris, um, you're, you're, you automatically have, a, you know, an obligation to, to register and file. So, you know, that's something that, you know, you ought to be, Engaging with a tax specialist like your your simply VATs, Avalara's, Accordance, um, VAT, and and Meridian Global Services of the world, who can actually then you know not just you know look at your sales data and and give you hopefully a very uh, accurate picture of you know exactly where you need to register, but then ultimately how much do you need to pay and um, you know uh, give you filings for that. So um, in terms of paying VAT, make sure that you know you're not needlessly converting um, those euro earnings into pounds and then back into 
your roads to pay the VAT. Make sure you are using um, a, a localized uh, collection model like what you get with the World Account with World First, where you can keep the, the earnings in country and, and pay directly to the VAT authorities. But, you know, it, it is something, you know, I've had lots of clients and, and actually a good friend of mine recently who said that, you know, they've been selling, you know, a couple of thousand euros worth of products into Europe. Um, and it wasn't really economically viable for him to register for that and to pay that, he said. But, you know, he has no choice because he has been using FBA because he's, a, you know, a, he's effectively a two-man band. He wants to, you know, uh, keep his hands off the products. He, does, you know, wants that all to be handled by Amazon. But ultimately, now he faces either increasing his prices by 25% to account for that or, you know, potentially absorbing some of that in his margin. So, um it's you know it is a tricky one and you know unfortunately um you know i'm all you know fortunately really because it is a level playing field now and um i think that's what you know sellers overall have been asking for for years uh, particularly with the influx of you know um sellers from from asia that they felt perhaps they were being unfairly penalized you know the fact that they, they were paying that and perhaps some of them weren't that registered and, and it is overall i think a good thing but ultimately it does create another logistical headache for for online sellers so so just speak to a specialist speak to an expert fantastic craig i think we're out of time for today and i'd just like to remind everyone um to register for our final webinar in this series which is the 5th of december and you can register if you go to tamebay.com and click on events in the top menu bar you'll you'll find the link to register for the webinar there and um, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise again today craig um absolutely fascinating webinar and looking forward to the next one absolute pleasure chris thank you very much uh, to to you guys at tame bay and thank you to everyone who's listening